Welcome to the Rollwise Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike, and I'm here with my co-host, Brent. Say hi, Brent. Hello, everybody. And today, we are here to jump into the, the most amazing topic of two horror-themed games. Last week, we kind of just gave our overall uh, impressions on horror, what makes good horror, what maybe makes horror a little bit challenging around the table, and how you're not supposed to kill your players for real. You're just supposed to scare the characters in game and all those kind of things. Um, but also last week, we told you that we'd be taking a look at two specific horror games. And so we kind of wanted to jump in to talk about those games a little bit. But I think before we get into that, I think we need a tiny bit of news. Um, I know, I know I saw it and I think Brent now knows about it, but recently, uh, as we all know, one D and D continues to, to make waves every so often. And while we're definitely not a, a news channel, I think, I think that's the word that you're looking for is continues to fascinate. Con, it, it does continue to fascinate, but, um, but the, the, uh, the one D and D has recently released its second on earth arcana, which had, you know, it's, a uh, it had a uh, what is it? It's you know the the cl- expert classes and everything like that. So I think there's going to be a section of our podcast that we might call it D and D Watch because it's almost like um like deep sea tourism where we go out on the high seas and we see you know just some really random shit from Wizards of the Coast about one D and D and it's almost noteworthy to talk about uh, because you know for whatever reason one D and D is uh, causing a lot of uh a lot of people to become very passionate keyboard warriors, especially in places like Reddit, YouTube, and all that stuff. What do you say, Brent? You want to talk about 1D&D for a few minutes before we jump into your horror game? Uh, I think it is good to talk about, because I know we have somewhat conflicting opinions on it, and and everybody has an opinion on it, so we should probably give our two cents on it. Do you think we should call this like Whale Watch, because 1D&D is the, the the big game? Just cluster watch, kind of. Like... This is just such a. a <laughs> the, so D and D CF edition. <laughs> yeah, D and D cluster. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh. So, so, so the news for those of you that are are keeping up with it um, is obviously that you know they released their survey about their expert classes. Now, obviously, people in the forums went and battled, you know, using their razor wits, their um, super skills, whatever you want to call it. And they kind of expressed their opinions about why certain changes felt good, why certain changes didn't feel good. And when we last kind of looked at it, we knew that there were some, we knew that there were definitely some things internally that they were doing to, you know, manage the the progress of, you know, 1D&D and all that stuff. But they still, it was an open invitation to the community, right? It wasn't uh, it wasn't just one or two people. It was literally anybody with a D&D Beyond account got to access the um, playtest materials, and they could hypothetically try out these new classes in you know uh, anywhere any any tier of play and all that stuff. But um, today they released a survey, and uh, the survey looks pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. What do you think, Brent? Do you think this is the? Do you think that they're really going to be able to use the data that they're collecting from this survey? Uh, no, and and again, kind of like we were talking about, I don't necessarily know if they want to. Like, I kind of feel like there might be some, like, just kind of glad handing of like, be involved, and then just sweep it under the rug. Is kind of how I feel about it, um, because it definitely doesn't seem great like it doesn't seem the the survey seems not good in my opinion well i mean i don't know about other people and maybe anybody that's been a consumer at any of any product has you know received that survey at the end of your interaction with a company or maybe after you purchase something or something like that and everybody knows that if that survey is too long, you're not going to fill it. Like the normal people aren't going to fill it out. Like, and I don't know if I'd consider D and D players ourselves included as normal, but I don't think I have the constitution to fill out their survey. Like, I was bored just looking to see what the questions were. Like, there's what thirty different selections on each page that you have to say if you're satisfied, slightly satisfied, dissatisfied or fucking hate it like 
Well, yeah, it's, was... like, and it's like I said, surveys alone, like even when there's surveys like in the industries we both worked for, like we both know that surveys are it's pretty simple who you, who is going to answer your survey. Um, it's either the people that are super pissed off who are like, I'm going to give these people a piece of my mind. God damn it. Or it's the people that are like, oh, no, they do a great job. They're fantastic. Um, like there's no middle to that scale, especially if it's nine million where it's long. Like, like I'm talking like five question surveys. People are like, no, no, man, I'm good. So I can't imagine there. Are, it'll be interesting to see what their numbers are on how many people. Because haven't they been telling people like, well, I mean, this is how many people answered? Yeah, they did. I mean. And, I mean, and of course, so much you know, as we can trust that information, I guess. I mean, if we want to, you know, go full tinfoil hat, yeah, you know, then we, can we can conspiratorial. We can we can basically say they, they you know, because if they say that forty thousand people filled out that survey with any sort of confidence, I think they might lie. Because the last survey, at least, was shorter than this one, and this one is like, I mean, you have to literally go through the the unearthed arcana and then line by line you know that's a, that's the real horror story here is to try to fucking do this survey that's the <laughs> that's, well and then that's... and, and then like we talked about like we talked about before like there's some debate on whether or not this is a actual like play test <laughs> well yeah and i and i think that you know we we probably can agree to disagree that you know like it would it would be nice and helpful to see if like the game plays, you know, knowing design goals and everything like that. But I, I, I mean, the, but the way the survey is designed doesn't really require you to have those types of those types of design goals in mind. You just have to say whether you like something or not. And since this this is this setting, I mean, it it's going to be very much how do you feel about the setting, assuming you can get through the surveys. But I think they just got a little too granular. You know, they kind of buried what they were looking for in, in just too many too many questions like somebody was just like well i bet if we got all these questions we'd get some really good data and then somebody forgot to you know actually go well if you got this survey would you actually take this survey <laughs> uh again i just kind of i just kind of think that they don't they don't really want the information as much as they want people to think they do maybe it's, <laughs> that's kind it's, of my impression it is, is uh, how, how many how many questions can we put on this a thousand sure throw them on there well, but at least at least they created a survey, you know, through a system that wasn't overtly just like, you know, using Microsoft, you know, survey you know, monkey, just send you a survey just, monkey. Yeah. Just a survey monkey with like a bad, you know, JPEG of of wizards just in the corner being like, this is obviously official. Go for it, you know, because <laughs> that would be that would have been way too expensive. That would have been know? amazing. Let's be yeah. honest, that would have been incredible if they were like. Uh, we can just survey monkey that, right? Like we can just we don't need to actually have anything of our own to do that, right? We can just like <laughs> item A. How did you feel about it? <laughs> that would have been that would have been the most amazing thing in the world if they were like, we don't want to yeah. really spend any money on this. I will give them credit for that. They are spending, they are using budget mm -hmm. um, on survey on data. Doing this. Yeah, um, well, and whether whether or not I really think like I really don't think they're going to use this information um because maybe and maybe that's because i'm jaded but i just don't well kind of like what they said last time when they said oh yeah some changes were made before we got your we made some changes before we ever got any the of the survey, survey data. information yeah well because you know obviously the, the in addition to the surveys we they'd be you'd be stupid to say that they weren't like trolling around in these subreddits and youtube and stuff like that to really get a, a feel for how people are responding because i mean not to say that you know people have um you know, the ability to necessarily influence them. Because I, I think this is where it's always one of those, if you have a strong design in mind, you know, you're going to hopefully make minor changes to clean up some of the stuff that maybe isn't as good, or maybe you didn't think of. But like, I, I, I don't think they're designing by committee, <laughs> like basically saying, we want a new edition. What does the community have to say about that? And then they go, oh, well, the community says we should change X, Y, and Z, you know. No, no, no. And like no, I said, no. like I kind of said before, I really strongly feel like mostly they're shooting for the scream test method, where it's like, um, oh, this didn't make everyone mad. No one threatened to like Pathfinder us again. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really feel like that's that's the goal. Is like they want to just make sure that they don't cut their <laughs> they don't cut their fan base in half again. Yeah. Um, I think that's really the uh. 
I think that's really the the goal here is to just be like, what can we do to minimize people wanting to go away if we make these changes? Um, True. And I think that's because like Pathfinder, I think Pathfinder was, I mean, Pathfinder may not be, I don't know if Pathfinder is as big as it was like right after the change, but like Pathfinder became big. I like, mean, well, yeah, Paizo became the, 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 like the second game that people played. Like it was like D and D or Pathfinder. Then, like those are the two games that people played. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and Pathfinder's gotten better over the years too. They've been doing a pretty good job with it. So yeah, and the, and again, the one thing that D and D has is name brand recognition. I think again mm-hmm. because like yeah. people are still like, well, what game does Matt Mercer play? He plays D and D. Okay, well, I'm gonna play D and D too. Yep, join on in. So okay, well, uh, that's that's all for this week's episode of. So everybody, go fill out your surveys. Um, take take you know your your hour and a half um lunch break at work and go fill out your D D survey so you can uh you can be involved i guess um you can hope that you're involved you, <laughs> you can, can you can have that shiny feeling that that's that's good but but also just know that we're two corporate drones that have had that have given out customer satisfaction surveys in our previous jobs and and while we, it, the intention may have been to actually do something with that survey there's a lot of things that pretty much leaves that that can, that can leave that information on the table. So. True, our opinion of this may be a little jaded. That's that is true. I guess you're right. We should probably uh, we should probably mention that. But yeah, yeah, but the, yeah, but but I'm, but you know that's what we're here for. We're here to give you our honest opinions because we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not shills. We don't get paid by anybody. So you know, mostly because no one's offered. Um, yeah. There's I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess if you see a, a general t- change in tone, it's it's because that <laughs> WotC money started coming in. Oh yeah, that survey, that's that was brilliant how they put four thousand lines for each question. I I, I will tell that. you, T and D one best damn experience I've ever had. <laughs> so I mean, I, I hate to I hate to say that we might sell out, but if that's if you hear that tonal change on these <laughs> these whatever weekly whale watcher Watsy watches or whatever we whale watch called. Watsy watch that's good I like I like Watsy watch. Watsy watch yeah it sounds like we were definitely talking about Nazis <laughs> I didn't even think of that but well. uh, yeah Watsy sounds I think that I think that uh, has always been the vague uh, vague notion of calling it Watsy is that. Uh, there's certain words what? that it that it sounds like. Oh well, I couldn't I I couldn't say what those words are obviously, but uh, I, we'll let you guys give your best <laughs> impression. Use your imagination, I guess. Uh, so yeah. so Indeed. yeah, so uh, moving on to the actual subject matter for this week's episode. Um, you know, we had two games that we picked, and I picked my game Vason, and Brent, you picked Unknown Armies. Correct. Um, wh- who? Where do you want to start? Uh, well, let's go into Vason because that is the game that I'm least experienced with, so I have a lot of mm. curiosity about it. Okay. And then um, I have quite a bit of experience with uh, Unknown Armies, so it can help yeah. uh, educate. Um, so yeah, why don't we start with Vason, though? I'm curious. So- sounds good. So so just so everybody knows, um, my resume for games and everything like that is I played games. Uh, I haven't really designed any games or anything like that. So from an experience <laughs> standpoint, um, I'm not giving you the game designer view. I'm giving you like, you know, I've read the books, or at least I've read the book that, you know, that uh, the the core rule book and everything like that. And I've uh, done some simulations in my, in my spare time to kind of see how stuff plays out just to kind of familiarize myself with the system. Uh, but uh, we're, we're going to give you my impressions, you know, uh, how what is basin how it goes and all that stuff i'm pretty sure anybody who's been anybody who's maybe listened to the first couple episodes probably knows that we're not game designers but you know what uh, i appreciate your candor uh well a lot of the game designers i know that they just did it like i know a few of the indie gamers that i listen to indie game designers that i listen to on uh um, different podcasts like they just one day did it it is not my, it is so if you're dreaming you might as well just go for it i think is what i'm saying oh, it's not um, a bad idea 
I just, I think that the hard part is, is that, you know, I'd want to do something for like a living. And I feel like game designing is one of those side, jo- side gigs you get. And then you have like a real job until you, you make it. I don't know how many game designers have made it on just game designing though. Uh, it's pretty hard. It's not, yeah. uh, I mean, this is a, this is a side tangent from our actual subject matter, but from what I've listened to on a couple of the folks that who have moved from the normal sector two to the game designer sector like it's pretty it's kind of difficult because um yeah. game, i mean you're 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 basically a niche a niche in a niche um is what you're trying to live off of so patreon i think has helped a lot for people yeah. um because kickstarter, definitely patreon I'll kickstarter um like podcasts like a lot of them have podcasts that make them a decent i don't know if it's decent but that makes them a wage um so like i think that's helped but yeah i think it is a definitely one of those uh it's 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 like any well it's like i don't know any sort of writing is always hard and then when you're writing a niche within a niche it's going to be even a little bit more difficult so exactly because not every not every game you design is going to just be D D right off the bat so um uh well i mean culturally <laughs> none of them are <laughs> I mean, if we, I mean, statistically, Everyone. if we look at it, none of the games so far have been D and D right off the bat. It's pretty much still the, uh, it's the, you just it's ha- you have to start still somewhere. the elephant. It's still the elephant that uh, occupies the space, the liminal spaces between spaces. So, um, yeah. Okay. So Vason, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. I think it's, I think it's a Vason as in like you know you kind of combine the ae sound and all that stuff is it is a swedish game and um i don't know if you know this but did you know that free league is a, a swedish publishing company i did yeah I did. like i i you know i've seen their games when i go to the local game store and all that stuff and so i've always thought that the games look like they have a high production value um however uh, my local gaming store did not have a copy of the core books so, you know, when my local gaming store has, doesn't have a copy, you know, I usually kind of go back and forth in my head if I want to have them order it, which is a lot longer, or if I just go on Amazon and, and pay Amazon's price. Uh, but today I did something a little bit, or th- this time I did something a little bit different. Today is not the right time, because I actually did this last week, aka a week before this podcast. So whenever the hell you listen to this podcast, a week before it this time that's when i did it uh past mike did it to help future mike basically yep it, he did he did so i actually went to the free league website and um the free league website has got gaming bundles on there that are actually fairly attractively priced um they were also running a sale so the uh the vason kind of role-playing bundle that they were offering which was like a core book a digital copy of the core book some dice some cards a gaming screen like a pretty robust thing was only 700 krona um yep can we get that in uh in uh american money no (laughs) just kidding no it was uh i think it was like 70 some odd dollars um and so you know basically what happens is you buy it from the free league website you 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 know you pay them immediately in whatever non US dollars it is. So technically, depending on how strong the US dollar is, you might have gotten a better or a worse deal than I did. Uh but it was like ten bucks to ship it. And uh yeah, it was I mean it was good to get the, the PDF right out of the gate so I could start reading that right away. Um but honestly, I'm not sure I'm gonna order from the Free League website again, because I have heard hide nor hair of where this actual bundle is <laughs> inside hmm, of Interesting. So, um, I mean, if anybody from Free League happens to be listening, could you guys check on my order? Like, what is happening here? Is it coming from Sweden or? If anybody from Free League is listening to this, thank you. Um, yeah. But that's interesting because, like, um, like I order off uh, Modifius, mm-hmm. which is another. I think, They're in the UK, if I remember correctly. Are they in the UK? I think the um, main store is. I don't know if they have a U.S. side. Or uh, because they, yeah, I don't know. They don't. I'm sure they don't have a U.S. side, but they are always pretty on top of getting me the information. So that kind of surprises me. I assumed, uh, I assumed Modifius would be kind of on the, or I assumed Free League would be kind of on the same sort of ball as them. So that's kind of interesting. I I would too. I mean, I, obviously the the jury's still out. I mean, I you know the the to steal to get the bundle the way 
you know, the, the pricing that it is and the amount of stuff that comes with it. So if it takes a little bit of time, okay, sure, whatever, why not? Um, but that was just my purchasing experience. So to get it, still was able to get the, the PDF copy, read through that. Um, and I think that, uh, I think those gaming bundles look pretty nice. And so, I mean, I might get some of their other gaming bundles, you know, for some of the other games that look really interesting that use that. You mean that if you game. actually get the games? Yeah, if I get the games and it's a good, like, it's not, like, I don't, I don't want to get the, the bundle and like open it up and ha- having like um, some sort of spike going through all the different products. So it's just right out of the gate, waited three weeks, and then I'm now stuck in some queue to try to get another copy of it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, understandable. I'm sure you'll get it. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be fine when you get it. Yeah, I'm sure it is too. Um, so, so top level Wait, is, is, uh, Forgotten Lands, that's Free League too, isn't it? Or is that Modiphius? Uh, yeah, Free League is, they do Forgotten Lands. Or, okay. I think it's Forgotten Lands. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, that the fantasy game. Um, that's interesting, because I did order that. Now that I think about it, I did order that off their, their main page, mm-hmm. and I got updates and stuff on it. I mean, well, I kind of look at ordering books from far-off exotic places as, uh, as like, Christmas. Like, I, I'm like... I'm just going to forget I ordered this. And then uh, when it gets here, it'll be like Christmas. It'll be a nice surprise. Oh, that's probably true. You know, because um, for Forbidden Lands, that's the one you're thinking of, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Forbidden yeah. Lands. That's the one that I was thinking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I believe I bought that from, I believe I bought, because I usually try to go to, um, I usually try to go to the company first. And then if they're, mm-hmm. and then if they're, their website is just like an abomination and I can't figure out how to order something which does happen occasionally um <laughs> uh that's usually when i when i'm like well like genesis like i couldn't find i went to their which is a different game we'll talk about at a later date i'm sure um i went to their website to try and find their books um and you can't order them in, off of their website anymore i found out but i tried to find it and when i couldn't that was when i started going to like amazon to be like hey does anybody else have it for less than three hundred dollars, the answer is no. <laughs> that's that's tough, man. And and I think that that's you know I'm I'm a big fan of like kind of trying to cut out the middleman myself. So if if you know there's an option to you know basically pay them directly, just because they you know I I mean honestly if they sell it to Amazon, I don't know if they get as good a deal when they do that kind of stuff. And maybe it's just my own personal bias, but I'm I'm one of those guys. that's like well if I can give the the local the local guys something or if i can get the um if i can give it directly to the you know the publisher or game designer i mean hell well yeah and sometimes ordering them off amazon um one of the things that happens sometimes is uh um it's from a set it's from somebody who's already bought it like you're actually mm-hmm. getting it from a different bookstore yep yeah um so and i usually prefer to try and give it to the company if i can although they did get their money already i guess so yeah, they they got my they got their money. Now I'm gonna have to go around and ask them where's my carpet or whatever it is. Um, that's non sequitur. So I was gonna say so, I don't I don't I don't know that reference. Um, you you managed to uh, to throw one out there that I didn't know. So congratulations. It's, up. it's all good. Um, so Vason, uh, so at its base level, um, Vason is Nordic horror, and it's set in the the quote unquote mythical north of Scandinavia. Now, you know, when they, when I think they, like, they say Nordic horror, I don't really think there was anything that was, like, particularly, like, I don't think Nordic horror by itself is its own genre of horror. There's not something special that, that, you know, that's happening in here that's different. I think it very much is using, you know, kind of folklore, um, kind of that juxtaposition of, like, you know, how progress ruins the environment and stuff like that and how, you know, we, we sometimes don't realize necessarily how disrupting how disrupting nature the nature around us it, you know how that's going to impact things and so they so that the kind of the the horror that it tries to include is that horror about you know the supernatural it's very kind of localized stuff where you know you tree spite tree sprites pixies water you know water spirits you know everything that's kind of nordically themed and what i thought was really interesting about this is that the um the guy who originally wrote uh or the guy who is uh, kind of the key person for this was actually uh i'm gonna probably butcher this and i apologize his name is johan egger egger kranz 
And if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. But um, he wrote a, an original book that was called Vason, and it was like a kind of like a folklore book. And so this folklore book, you know, was well illustrated by this guy because I guess in his personal experience, he was um, interested in he, like he at, at the age of 10, he picked up like the Swedish version of like the Monsters Manual from D&D. Mm-hmm. And he just fell in love with monsters as a concept. And so like at the age of 10, he was like, I guess he he was like, I'm going to be a game illustrator. <laughs> and so I think it was about 2013 or something like that. He created this um, this book called Basin, and it had a bunch of, you know, Nordic uh, folklore type creatures and stuff like that. And then Free League contacted him. And that's what that was. That concept art was kind of the turned into the concept for the game. So I thought that was kind of a, an unusual, uh, kind of an unusual journey that that took. But I also thought it was kind of cool to have that be so central to the entire game idea for how this, um, for how this is currently played. And well, it's so kinda, that's kind of interesting because that seems to be, from what research I've done, that seems to be kind of how, um, like Genesis, which is a mm-hmm. German game, that seems to be how that kind of came about too. Was the art was the main driving principles yeah. so that's that's kind of interesting that two games kind of have the same kind of driving principle um i do have one question really quick about uh Bayer. sure um is it a modern game or is it a historical game so so the 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 way the book is written is it is written as kind of a historical game uh it takes place in what would be considered the 19th century uh, 19th century Sweden, but it's not, it's like alternate history, 19th century. Um, things that are, you know, things like we would have to kind of, you know, they don't want you to play a historically accurate Sweden where there right. may be marginalized communities and all that kind of stuff. They want to empower you to have a, a history that could be free from, you know, technological limitations. You want a steam engine, you want all these kind of things. It doesn't really matter when they were introduced in Sweden. Right. They're it's more of a, a <laughs> yeah, it's more of a fancified. Mm-hmm. Uh, game, but it's not a modern horror game. It's a fan. It's a it, fantasy horror game. Well, exactly. It's it's. But I mean that. So the interesting part is, is while it is fantasy, and really you're just taking that 19th century vibe. You know the way people dressed. You know the kind of I would almost call it that dandy, like look that you know they they get and stuff like that, where everyone look has certain specific looks, certain coats. They wear breeches. They wear trousers you know all that kind of stuff is um the I, we don't get to use the word pantaloons very often but i think pantaloons might have been involved in this somewhere but um but you know it has kind of a certain vibe to it and so you just you're kind of not necessarily unless it's probably specific to your game not going to set a hard date in time that you're playing in the game and all that stuff because you don't want people to have to worry about well what was what were the russians doing during this time is that going to be important to the game you can just kind of insert it if necessary yeah it's not a game of historical accuracy but it's not a modern game either it's not no 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 cell phones no cars no yeah um, no cell phones no cars etc yeah but the the thing about basin and the way that's written i I don't think you should limit yourself necessarily to that 19th century concept. You could put this in a more modern because all it really is is, I mean, you just you just have pushed the the you know you push the basin farther away from these places. You know, your villages are smaller and more remote, but the the concept still could exist. You know what I'm saying? Like you could still have that person who goes to the you know he's in Stockholm and then goes to his, you know, like family's village out in the mountains. And then there are still trolls that, you know, they have to figure out what's going on because the, the trolls are a menace or something. You know what I'm saying? You could, you could, you could have troll hunter if that makes any sense. You remember yeah, that? Yeah. 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 No, I'm a big fan of troll hunter. I was just more, yeah, I guess I was just more curious if there is a mm-hmm. set setting or not. So that's pretty interesting. Yep. 19th century is the set setting, but you could go with whatever you want to. Yeah, and, and the other thing, because it, it is set in a way that it's about folklore and how the mysteries kind of revolve around these basin. Um, it, it's pretty, it's pretty versatile to have this type of setting anywhere, like in any part of the world. Cause all you're really doing is you're taking that folklore, incorporating it into the va- the basin, um, you know, kind of the, the structure, and then you can create mysteries anywhere, you know, anywhere that has, you know, creatures that are kind of supernatural and unexplained that, you know, the you could you could tie that in. You could go to South America, Japan, England, doesn't matter. You can you can be anywhere with this, which I thought was kind of a neat 
a, a neat thing to think about how this could be expanded outside of Scandinavia and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, and we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because uh, we don't know what a basin is yet. Uh, we don't. Um, okay, so let let's talk about that a little bit from the lore then. So the you know some so from the lore itself and everything like that is, as i said before you know it's kind of the tale of progress you know humans have progressed and then when you get to the 19th century you start to see like industrialization and all those things so people felt that kind of magnetic pull away from those smaller villages and everything like that younger people started going to the big big cities and everything trying to make a name for themselves technology was advancing at an incredible pace and you start having these these old traditions and everything like that slowly getting lost or quickly depending on the depending on the type of situation um and you start having these basin who are now finding that the disruption of nature is causing the you know the balance to get out of whack so now basin which were previously you know dom like a, well, i guess i should actually say basin which are kind of these supernatural creatures which were you know previously dormant or maybe didn't do very much because they were appeased with the the offerings that were given now have become erratic not behaved like they have in the tales or whatever that may be and so the vasin themselves are they, like i said they're supernatural in nature um but they're they're kind of like dryads wood sprites grims anything that you've heard from kind of folklore is is considered a vasin for this game now the game itself does give you about 20 or so vasin to kind of play with in the beginning, but once you get the structure down for how the vasin is set up, again you can use any folklore creature to um to, to include it, like a troll. I mean they they include trolls in this game and stuff like that, and those are quote unquote vasin. Mm -hmm. So um the the thing that sets the players apart in the game is that rather than just being your normal people, each of the players are actually um Going to, are going to be investigators that have the gift of what's called the sight. So Vasin are normally hidden, like the, the normal person can't see them, uh, you know, and so really they, they're just kind of these, almost these spirits that exist more in concept than reality. The, of course, the effects of the Vasin are what you would consider, you know, maybe just natural implications of, oh, we poured the, or we cut down this crop of trees and then this other thing happened, you know, but that, that other thing is actually facilitated by the basin to the, to the supernatural investigator. Now they get something called the sight and the sight allows them to see the basin, which is very, very helpful, I guess. <laughs> so, right. If you're going to be searching for, uh, fake creatures, it's probably good if you can see them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very, I think that, I think it's kind of helpful. Um, you know, so they get something called the sight and usually the sight is from a traumatic event that, um, you know, that allowed them to kind of pierce the veil, see them with on the regular and be able to, uh, to, you know, participate in these kind of understanding of these mysteries and find these supernatural creatures. And the main thing that these investigators are tied to, and this is kind of like the collaborative part, is that they're usually um, tied in with a group that's called the society. Now, this the interesting thing here is that I know you've had this comment about like D and D and stuff like that is like adventurer is a profession in D and D, which is just you say it's like the weirdest thing ever, right? Because <laughs> you're just like right. Oh, you're yeah, there's an economy there that that is a little bit difficult for me sometimes to put my to put my mm -hmm. finger on where it's like like yeah, where it's like, oh no, I go out and I do adventures for a job and it's like what exactly does that mean? Cuz like mercen like if an adventurer includes going and soldiering at all, well that just means you're a mercenary. Exactly. Or a tomb raider or you know mm -hmm. That sort of thing. So it's a little weird that like adventurer is considered this like noble job in some things, whereas yeah. it's more like, no man, you're you're probably a mercenary. But but like so, you can kind of pass that off. I'm I'm kind of over that. But it's something that uh, <laughs> that it has in the past been very very strange to me. Well, uh, and it's and so they don't they don't try to make it like the the they don't try to make it so like the society is like that's. That's typically not your job in most cases, although it can be, obviously. Well, that, well, that makes that makes kind of more sense if there's like we're a society and we look for spooky shit, because mm -hmm. I mean we have we have that now. Like we have, yeah. like that's not that's not an adventurer. That's just a, it's just weird, a weirdo. Um, exactly. I mean, paranormal investigation is is a current thing. 
Um, and there are people that make a living out of it. Like, so mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong on this adventurer stick. Um, but beings being an adventurer usually means, you know, stabbing things. I think that's the part that most paranormal investigators don't like carry yeah. firearms. Um, well, exactly. I guess is, I guess the big well, difference. And they, and they can in this game. And so, so basically, but being a part of the society is it's being part of a club and the club itself. Um, I won't go into too many details so that, you know, in case any players are sitting, thinking about playing this is that yeah, the like society. An, an oh, adventurer's ahead. club, I think makes sense. Like, yeah. Well, and you, and you're, and you basically, you're, you're restarting this society because inexplicably, you know, you, the society ceased to exist about 10 years prior to the, the, your group of investigators getting called together. Um, now how they, how they get everybody together. This game is very much more a storytelling game than a very rules heavy kind of crunchy game. And so a lot of this stuff is going to be done kind of collaboratively and the, the, the uh, game master is going to be guiding them. Um, but you know, you, your guys and gals could come together with through a variety of means. And it's, it's, this is going to be something where you're going to want to talk it out kind of as a, a precursor to the game. You know, like, why are you investigators? How are you introduced to the society? And because it has some of these supernatural things, I mean, you could, you could be drawn in by a prophetic dream, you know, like there's all kinds of hooks that you could use to, to get mm -hmm. your character introduced to all these other things. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And so the, uh, so the creating a character, I actually thought creating a character was pretty easy for this. Um, you know, when I went through it, I, since I hadn't, I mean, this is the funny thing about role-playing games in me is that I feel like almost every game I've played has been like handed down through tradition. Like somebody's taught me how to play the game, except for like D and D when I originally started learning how to play D and D. But usually like I, it's, and I, I, maybe that's just lately, I haven't really had the need, but there's been very few games that I've been like, Oh, I want to play this game. So I'm going to go buy the book, read the book, and then teach everybody else. <laughs> like, I feel like I've always been the benefit of other people teaching me these games. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't I didn't actually think about that till I started reading through this, and I was like, oh, so, so I don't really have anybody to tell me. Well, I guess I'll have to do all the heavy lifting. Um, but the heavy lifting in this case turned out to be two hours of kind of reading through the, the book, learning everything about it, kind of understanding what the different components were. And so I don't think that's a heavy – I don't think that's a heavy lift at all for – not having touched the game to having a, a created character. Um, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So it wasn't too bad. Um, in this game, you start kind of with your personality, your archetype, and there are 10 archetypes that they recommend. Um, I think you could make archetypes if you wanted to, but I don't, I, I think that, you know, for balance reasons, you know, you don't, you're not just going to make up the archetype that's perfect for base and killing because the game isn't a really about base and, killing if that makes sense the one right. thing that they're very very keen to make you aware of is that your goal isn't to just create the bigger badass to go hunting vason although that could be a game it's just not this particular game right this this game is more like you know scooby-doo mystery machine trying to understand like you know and it, and it could be a mundane source of where the the mystery is coming from you know it's like oh you know yeah, mr jorgen a... is <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's more of a story. Problems. It's more of a storytelling game than like a power mm -hmm. fantasy game. Yeah, you're not going to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so just just for fun, I created an officer. Um, went through the different processes. You know, you kind of decide what kind of personality, other characteristics. You, your age is a a thing that you have to worry about because depending mm -hmm. on your age bracket, um, you actually get different attribute points to spend and skill points. So if you're young, you happen to have higher attribute points but lower skill points, and if you're mm -hmm. old aka 51 years or above you get lower attribute points and more skill points um it actually does you get more total points the older you are you know with it being that you know you get actually 25 points between the two as a young person and 27 points between the two as an old person so right that there is sense. a benefit you know? the more experienced you are the mm -hmm. yeah the more experienced you are the more knowledge you have basically Exactly. And and I mean, in this game, because it's kind of a dice pool game, having more points to spend is important because when you're choosing your attributes, you only have four attributes to choose from. Uh, you have your um, two physical, which is like your physique and precision, if precision, and you have your two mental, which is your logic and empathy. So if you have 
you know, 13 points to spend between those, you actually end up with some pretty high numbers, um, or at least high feeling numbers if you've never played the game. Because I was like, it's almost kind of like when you play like White Wolf and you're like, you know, between one and five. I mean, is one really that bad? Is five really that good? It's It doesn't really feel like anything until you actually get the dice rolling and stuff like that. Right. The but, scale is, the, the you don't really understand the scale until you start mm -hmm. playing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so the scale wasn't really crazy, but your each archetype has a primary stat, which is allowed to be five. Otherwise, they max out your stats at four, and then you choose skills, and your skills can be zero to five. Um, and that's and you know, so it's it's basically then you're what you're going to do is you're going to you know use those to generate your dice pools for when you roll and everything like that. Um, the parts that I thought were really interesting about that creation process is that you you get to decide your trauma. And the archetypes do help you, like, give you some ideas as to, like, what your traumas and dark secrets could be. And so, like, a trauma for an officer is you lost all your men to an angry giant. <laughs> and that's that's why you got the sight. And it's like, that, you know, I mean, even though it's kind of just their stock trauma, you could work that in very easily to a story for, you know, either a military officer that's semi-retired or a military officer that's, like, a pensioner or something like, you know what I'm saying, like... It makes it easy to kind of wrap those into the story, and then as a as a an aside, the dark secret it is something that you kind of have to decide if you um, you know how your dark secret plays into it. But your dark secret is usually something that you're ashamed of and you keep to yourself, and so it could be linked to your trauma. So like the officer that I created in question had a journal from one of the you know one of the soldiers that died in this giant attack, and so that was kind of his like. You know, that was the heavy weight that he carried kind of thing, you know. So I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And then uh, you do have some other things that you worry about. You get a memento, and your mementos are um, kind of something that help you portray your character and everything like that. And you can choose a memento, or you can use a, die, a D66 table to kind of, you know, see what goes, you know, what, what the, the random gods of chance will help you with your memento. Like you could get a dried red rose and then you have to work out what a dried red rose is. Right. There. Like, what does that mean for the, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean for your character? Um, and then your equipment loadout is going to be very basic. Like, um, like my, you know, my, my, uh, officer had like a, a pistol, um, a compass and a map book like <laughs> yeah that makes so, sense yeah so you know very it's it wasn't you know like D D where you had four thousand pages of equipment you know how much weight in gold were you carrying etc 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 so so character creation was pretty easy and i thought i thought the character i made this uh officer was was fun it, I, I could see playing him in the future if i wanted to and he could be more of the adventure type or it could be more mysterious and that's one thing I liked is they 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 tell you it's a game of mysteries and solving mysteries and stuff like that, but it's it kind of is threefold. It does have the horror, it does have the mystery, and it does have adventure. You could kind of do any of those by themselves, or you could kind of do a combination of all three when playing the game. So yeah, that's the basic lore and all that stuff. Whoo! I have to say that uh, mechanically, though, um, you know, I think it might just be me. But I, you know, when I actually started to figure out how the game is played, um, first of all, if you want to, you can you can play Vase and Solo. Uh, they have a, a Free League Workshop solo document that allows you to kind of like create a solo adventure using kind of an Oracle system that I thought was interesting. And I regret to say I did not have time to to do I was that. Gonna say, how many games? How many games did you get in? I was gonna. Ask. Oh gosh, I wish I could have done that. It's just you know how sometimes your brain gets a little bit melty over the course of a week remember i only had seven days to do this so. right, well uh, i'm kidding because uh i don't know i think uh a it, like a key part of gaming for me is involving other people so i don't know mm -hmm. um i commend you if you uh you get the chance to run yourself through a game but i uh i can see that being uh i don't know if i would do that so well we can more talk about solo games more power to time. you if you uh if you uh make that commitment i you know i was thinking about it i almost thought it and you know, just because i wanted to give it a, a try and see how it works but i i felt that that was a little bit more effort than i was i had the time to really put in between last <laughs> week and this week so um but mechanically it uses the year zero engine and i you know i haven't really played any games that have the year zero engine but as you said earlier 
um, Forgotten Lands is one of the games, and like Aliens is is one of the games, and Tales from the Loop is another game. So they're all using that same dice pool engine. But what's really interesting is they they tend to tweak the Year Zero engine for the play style of the game. Right. And it's my understanding, based on what I've read, that this is the very very watered down version of this engine with the most basic components to it. And so, you know, like when you, if you're, if you're forced to roll dice, you know, because I think that the, as a, the game master, the dice are there to add interest to the game rather than necessarily just be like, oh, well, I'm going to go try to pick this lock to try to see if I can get that document that I saw earlier. Oh, you didn't pick the lock. Now you're stuck forever. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's to right. try to add elements of excitement and variability and stuff like that. Um, and so you, when you're doing skill tests, it's super easy. All you're doing is taking your attribute and the associated skill, which I believe there are 12 of, and um, you roll your D6. That's all you get, D6. And if you roll one success in most normal checks, that's considered a success. Mm-hmm. Um, the GM can make it more difficult, saying that you either need two or three successes to, to make whatever happened happen. Um, but you can't do things that are like, magical like you can't you know walk up to a guy and be like i'm your superior officer i demand you jump off this bridge you know yeah, like, like mind control stuff <laughs> yeah, you can't like you can't tell them that you know you can't control their mind or anything like that and as a player you don't really get access to magic yeah. um that's really that's stri- that should strictly be in the basin realm unless of course your gm decides that's the game he wants to play so right more cult heavy or something about something that, sure. like that yeah um you can uh, you can do things and add additional dice through talents and advantages. Advantages being like a thing that you did before the mystery to kind of like give you a, a one-time boosty. It could be something as simple as, you know, the, before I went out of this mystery, I went down to the pistol range and really honed in my shot so that if you had to shoot somebody, you might get two extra dice in that scenario kind of right. thing. Um, and then you get to do something called pushing the roll. If you fail a test... Um, you can choose to muster your strength and give it one more try. And this can only be done once per action. And after you fail the test, you push, you suffer a condition. Now, conditions are really important in this game because it's like you get three conditions and that's it. Like, <laughs> right. anymore. like and if you start suffering conditions, you start suffering, you get to this 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 state called broken. Then when you're broken, you get a critical injury and then your character could die very quickly. So it, it's a very downward spiral from doing that. So you have to be very cautious about when you choose to do these pushing the rules. And, and I believe you don't have to assign a condition as the GM to it, but I think you just have to be, I mean, just be fair and understanding. Like, you know, if they're trying to push on this thing and if they, they, they push themselves, they exhaust themselves, right? That makes sense. Whereas sometimes it may they may try to push it but it doesn't really make sense so right yeah like they're trying to push it and then like narratively doesn't make any sense that they would do mm-hmm. that. yeah that makes sense yeah and so uh so that's kind of the the basics um i mean the combat is it's super deadly the you know if you get into combat with a vason it's really just to kind of hold the vason off it's not really to fight and win because the, I did do some simulation combats, you know, and they have NPCs in the book. Um, and like one of the NPCs is like a maid. And I was like, oh, let's just see what a, a, a cultist maid would look like if they were to try to stab me with a knife. And it was like, you know, even though you get a lot of D6, you know, in your dice pool, D6 are fickle. You can, you know, I mean, you're right. you're supposed to have an 80% chance of succeeding with like eight dice or something like that. But if you don't roll any sixes, that's still, you failed. <laughs> Right. No. You're still in trouble if that's what happened. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so, I mean, the bigger the dice pool obviously makes it better, but I, I mean, like, it was pretty much one hit and done for the NPCs. Like, if I got a hit on them, they, you know, they have a toughness value, and it was just like they were down. It wasn't, you know, what I was, it, it wasn't like a long, drawn out kind of thing. So it could literally be, you know, attack, parry, attack done like that's the entire combat um and yeah that's pretty common that's pretty common in horror games for combat to not be um Mm -hmm. to not be excessively uh excessive where it's more like yeah hey we did this oh you're dead yeah well that's that's what it felt like because i uh, one of those combats i like you know i got two conditions very quickly because you know the number of wounds or something that or the number of damage that you do equals conditions and so it's just like well 
you died. So it, I wouldn't be surprised if people said if you got into combat in Vase, then you were probably that's the worst position to get into, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's two last things, uh, you know, just from a mechanic standpoint that I thought were kind of interesting is first of all, in this game, they do have a meta about base building. So like, you know, the society, even though it's, you're kind of rebuilding it from the ground up, you actually get a, like a, a home base to do it from. And that is really, I think a fun mechanic. I, I think that would be the most interesting part of this from my perspective, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like rebuilding the society kind of thing and they've got some really interesting rules about how how you rebuild it like what you know types of things you start adding to the society and all those things and i and i think if i'm going to be playing with this with you guys i'm not going to go into too much detail about it but needless to say i was really excited about that meta and i thought that was really cool yeah that um, sounds interesting um because yeah. i mean like like you said the idea is that you're rebuilding like you're rebuilding your um your club right like you're rebuilding mm -hmm. you're rebuilding the society right yeah, so you're rebuilding it, and and your society needs a place to be. So, you need a place where you can hang out and you know make sure only the cool kids get in. So, right, and it, I think that's, that's a that place in Uppsala. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the other thing was is that um, advancement was really kind of a little bit weird, and I I think this is probably one of the weaker areas of the game. Is that like, I mean, you you so you have a set of questions that they use kind of at the end of each session. And and I think that um, it gets really tricky because it's, the questions for the experience points are like, did you participate in the session? Did you confront any basin? Did you identify a previously unknown basin? Were you affected by your dark secret? Did you take risks? And, you know, and there's eight questions total. Um, mm. And so, I mean, if you think about it as a session, I mean, with us, we play sessions that are short, right? You know, we play a two hour session once a week. And so if that session is not very productive, you can imagine that you know you're going to get a small number of experience points you know pretty frequently right like you, i could see you easily getting 2 to 3 experience points each session um even though the mystery wasn't <laughs> solved or anything right like even that. though you really didn't do anything like but i mean but i mean it it would feel proactive still so. yeah it's it's so it's a it's so i think this is probably the area that i it's a little bit weird because you know you have to kind of balance like how many experience points you get because after you get five experience points you can buy an advancement in either a skill or a talent and i know i didn't really talk detail about talents or anything like that but the talents that you're you get you know it could be anything from like wealth um it could be you know like bonuses to certain types of roles and all that stuff and i could like i said i could see that adding up because it, it doesn't like get more expensive by default you know, so it's just five points. So every five points you get, then you can get one of those two things. And with dice pools being the main, the main thing, you could you could have a a bigger dice pool much quicker than you might expect. And so I just I feel like the advancement gets a little bit muddy towards the end there. Well, yeah, but the, the thing about a lot of horror games though is like advancement isn't like um, mm -hmm. more combat heavy games where it's like all of a sudden your head and shoulders above like everybody else it's usually much smaller incre increments of advancement like yeah. it seems like you're going pretty far but it's um it's yeah. a, it's a small percentage increase so it's like you're not blowing people away oh well, exactly and i and honestly because there are caps on skills you can only get so far there i and i just since i haven't really played it out i don't know how it looks but i might be a little bit hesitant to follow it exactly as written you'd have to kind of take a look at how your sessions are being run to make sure that you're not because if you run a one shot mystery and it takes you three sessions, <laughs> right? You know, you're you're kind of it's kind of a little bit wonky there. Um, so I so final verdict. Honestly, I think the game looks fun. Um, I think that you know it. I could either play the game or or run the game, and I feel like I'd have a, a good time either way. Um, the Vasen are are interesting. I love the artwork that they, you know, the guys done for the book, and I think it has its kind of own unique style. Um, and it, mm -hmm. it makes for a very pretty game. I think they've done a lot of good work to make sure that the layout of the game is really good. I, and I and I and I like the mystery that they present, the time frame they present. There's a lot to love about how they put this together. Um, and I think that it's a since it's not so like cosmic in nature, you know, like it. I think that it's commonly going to be refer, like compared to things like Call of Cthulhu, and you know there may be tentacles somewhere involved in this, but you know you're not you're not fighting off the cosmos. You're just trying to save this little 
you know, beleaguered town <laughs> from from this right, thing that's much, definitely it's more than smaller, a nuisance. Yeah, it's a much smaller scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so and so I think that if you if you're looking for a game with crunch, you're probably not gonna find it here. You're probably gonna have to look elsewhere for all that kind of stuff. But if you want something with good story, a nice mystery, and strong role playing opportunities, I think I, th- I really think this is the game. So I can see why this is so popular. So so I guess you're gonna have to play this game with me when I decide to play it in a couple of weeks. So take that. Uh yeah, I'm I'm there for it. Uh it sounds like an interesting game. Like Nordic Horror, it sounds interesting to me because, um, I mean, I've done some reading about uh, Nordic mythology and stuff like that. So that kind mm-hmm. of thing sounds, it sounds interesting. It sounds actually um, mechanically an interesting game and subjectively, I said that right, uh, an interesting game. So yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's a thumbs up for me. I don't, we don't really have a, an official scale yet. So, I mean, our scale is going to be weird until we figure out what that looks like, but that's at least, you know, one thumbs up and, you know, a, a big smile for me. I think, uh, I think it's probably just, uh, Hey, yeah, go ahead and try it is, uh, probably as good of a, of a recommendation as we can give on some games. Mm. <laughs> So I the oh the recommendation is I'd play that almost like that there, would, there you go I'd play that I'd play that game there we <laughs> go that's the recommendation that's our final uh, actually you're saying you'd run that game because oh. well, you're the one that's going to be running the game so okay well I I'd run that there you go I, and maybe and you know what maybe that's the better that's the better indicator because just saying I'd play that that's that's the lazy way out if you said I'd run that that shows some real investment. Uh, well, this is, uh, in my gaming groups in the past, the measurement was always, if there's a game you want to play, probably going to be the one that runs it. So, um, <laughs> just, just be ready. So I think I'd run that game, uh, probably is a pretty good, uh, is, is you're, you're probably right. That probably is the best measurement. Okay. So this is, this is one I'd run that game out of one. Uh, yeah, it sounds like I'd run that game too. It sounds like it's pretty easy to pick up. Uh, the rules are pretty interesting. Subject matter sounds uh, interesting and fun. Um, and I do like me some horror games. So, so that's... yeah, I think that would be a thumbs up for me too. I haven't read the book, but it's from your okay. description. It sounds like a fun game. Sure. So that's two. I'd run that out of two. We're we're gonna we're gonna get this right. I I would I would I would pet that animal. <laughs> <laughs> There's All a right. system of measurement. It doesn't look rabid. I would pet that animal. <laughs> oh man. Well, <laughs> I, but well, that works. I mean, because I, because I'm, I'm, you know, obviously, I've just talked about a game about Nordic horror, and you have you know various basin that are animals. So you're like, I'd go pet that animal. What well, doesn't look rabid? But there is the sign. There is hellfire coming from its eyes. Just just as long as it doesn't look rabid. Rabies is absolutely terrifying. That's uh, that's my advice to you, listener. Is rabies terrifying? Yeah, that's that's the most horrifying thing we've talked about so far. So, all right. Well, we're going to change, I think, from uh, the ambiance of Nordic horror and, you know, and uh, the mystics, the mystic north um, to a different game, Unknown Armies. Now, I have played Unknown Armies with you once, Brent, but I don't think I have a lot of experience outside of that. So this is your baby. Uh, take it away, man. Uh, yeah. Unknown Armies is one of my absolutely favorite games, um, both to run. Uh, and I believe I played in a couple Unknown Armies games, if I remember right. Uh, mm-hmm. Nothing very long, but definitely one of my favorite games to run. Um, Unknown Armies, unlike Vason, is a modern occult horror game. Uh, I believe uh, one of its taglines is it's a game of existential horror. Um, so, one of the go ahead. I was just going to say, so a tale of existential horror. You might want to elaborate on what that could mean for people, because I think, I mean, I um, I don't think I've heard that that as a category before. Well, no, and it's a little bit different because um, a lot of like what people know of horror is like the Call of Cthulhu type games is probably the most common common one. Which is more like an existential horror, which involves um, a lot of idea of external threat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cosmic horror is a lot of your your kind of ignis, ign, 
in, uh, insignificant uh, to those things. Um, you know, to your choices are insignificant, and these creatures that you're fighting um, are vastly superior to to your abilities. So you're probably not going to be able. You can't stand against them and things like that. Whereas unknown armies kind of takes the opposite approach, where as human beings and unknown armies, you are it. Um, like most threats in unknown armies are human. Um, basically, human decision and human nature and human will is the driving force in unknown armies. One of the things that um, the, I think the, I believe the writer likes to say about unknown, unknown armies is that it is a game of it is where a game of where broken tr broken people are trying to fix the world um, is a tagline that the um, one of the writers of the game likes to use. Um, and I feel like that concept strongly resonates for me because I think one of the like people are probably uh, truthfully the scariest thing that can happen in your life um, yeah. one way or another. Um, if we look at the world, it's usually people doing things to other people that are actually where real horror happens. Um, exactly. I mean, it, you, so, only, you only have to look to Netflix to see the most popular, <laughs> the most popular genre of stuff on Netflix is, you know, serial killers and, yeah or mine hunter whatever else is uh on. yeah which which mine hunter is also a really good uh really good series and i would use i would say that as a good inspiration for um some on our on our army stuff but um so that's kind of like on an army's kind of flips that on its head where um the idea is is that oh no uh, your decisions matter like what you do not only does it impact you but it impacts kind of the whole cosmic coin um, like your decisions are truth. And so what you do matters in every sense of the word. Um, so instead of taking that kind of, uh, existential horror of, of that, you usually people going to look at it and you, you're like, Oh God, I don't matter. And stuff like that. No, on an army is the thing that says, Oh no, your decisions a hundred percent matter. Um, and not only do they matter in the sense of, of a grand scale, they matter in the sense of, um, like some of sometimes what you choose to eat in a day could cosmically affect everything. Um, so like, that's kind of the idea. Like the idea is, uh, you know, not just that, but like, if you become obsessed with something, you can literally change the world. That's the power in unknown armies is mm. you are like one of the taglines from unknown armies is, um, you know, you did it. That's always been, it's on the cover of the first edition book. Um, is you did it and what that means essentially is um you know spoiler is you are the driving force um and there's a few things in the background in the cosmology of unknown armies that i could talk about that explains that a little bit better um but that is the driving thing for unknown armies is you as a human you as a thinking person making decisions you are a thing that matters and you are the thing that can change the world um and everything terrifying about that is true um and that's the main conceit of unknown armies like most all the monsters in unknown armies um they all used to be human um everything from demons to um you know primals to you know the big bad um you know avatars and stuff that, that hunt people which i can explain later mm -hmm. like all of that stuff is driven by humanity um and so that's i think i believe that's what they kind of believe when they they describe an existent it is an existential horror game is mm -hmm. that a lot of times the dark stuff that's going to happen in the game is going to be driven by just human beings so because of that it has a tendency to be um a little more challenging psychologically to people because it's not you're not going to fight the cthulhu monster with tentacles um and if you do that Cthulhu monster with tentacles was probably summoned by a human being who's using it to do bad things. Yeah. 
Um, and so do and, you feel like do, do you feel like you have to be more prepared to to jump into that psychological thing with this to say like you know we're going to talk about what bad people do that is like really relevant to you so do you feel like I you do. have to kind of get your lines and veils and all that stuff more ready I, do, I do think i do think um unknown armies is a game that probably would require people to say hey some of the stuff that we're probably going to do here is going to be challenging um because it is like i said it is a game about people and broken people a lot of times um and broken people can be very it can be very psychologically hairy again my goal is never to my goal is to run a fun game not a game that's you know horrible there may be some challenging things in it but i'm not i'm i'm not present to make people's lives miserable yeah. so most of the time my games are going to be probably a little bit lighter, but it is, it is about horror. It is about, you know, broken people trying to change the world for, for good, for good or ill. Like sometimes it's going to be for bad too. Um, so that's one of the, that's, that's the main conceit about unknown armies. Um, now, did you, did you feel like, um, cause right now it's on third edition, right? Did you feel that the, that like the setting is pretty stable through all three editions, right? There's no like, right. It's a modern horror game. So basically the timeline passes along. I mean, it's played like you would play it. It's a little dated now because it was printed a few years ago, pre COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is, is that it uses, and, and what it does impact the unknown armies a lot. Cause there's a, a lot of pop culture, pop culture stuff that kind of comes up. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it is a modern game. So the timeline kind of keeps up. Um, you just kind of have to fill in the gaps. If like, if I wanted to run a game that takes place today, um, there would definitely be things that have been impacted with current political climate and stuff like that, that you would probably bring up, that would probably be a part of the game. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's a stable, it's a stable idea, a stable idea. The, the main idea of the, the setting is it's a modern game and your character is involved something called the occult underground, which is the idea that. Uh, there is occult happenings. They do happen, and there are people that know about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's best to kind of keep that from the light of the regular world because there's this fact called sleepers, which are regular people, which is the idea that any supernatural thing happening can't stand up to a million people knowing it's happening and want it to stop. Mm -hmm. um, so it stays underground. Hmm. Um, is that why it's called Unknown Armies? Yes, exactly. The unknown armies are the occult underground. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, um, makes sense. Yeah, now. yeah, and um, and like so, some of the lore in unknown armies, especially the stuff that's really, um, really interesting. And this is kind of a spoiler if people are running a game and you're running kind of a low level game. So warning to anybody who plays in a game and your DM would like you to be kind of ignorant of the fact. Um, but there is uh, kind of the lore of the game is. Uh, magic is based off of obsession, uh, off of obsession and paradox. So basically, anytime you have some sort of magical school where you're doing magic, quote unquote, um, basically you have become so obsessed with something um, that it allows you to change the world. Usually obsessed to the point of borderline insanity and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, if you kind of think about it that way, um, like uh, one of the schools that is in third edition and was in second edition is um alcoholics like you actually damage yourself so much being an alcoholic that you actually can change some aspects of reality um you know and the downside to that is you always have to be drunk which means you probably don't have uh, like you don't have a job um you're slowly killing yourself uh you know and that's sort of that's sort of the paradox is you have this fantastic power to do things but inevitably it will kill you um Sounds and dark, so all honestly. yeah, all the schools of magic are based off of that sort of paradox. Uh, another popular one is um, uh, it's called epiduromancy in the book, which is um, you can control reality because you control yourself through self harm. So that is another you know um, kind of scary hot topic. Um, there's chaos magic, which is just banking up risk um like you play russian roulette to, and the more time the more dangerous it is the more you bank up being able to affect reality but inevitably one of those risks is going to kill you um so it's it's sort of like that so that's the schools of magic and there's another thing called um the celestial clergy and this is one of the this is one of the meat and potatoes things about unknown armies that's really interesting 
um, is the celestial clergy is basically when someone manifests a concept so much, um, they kind of live their life to this concept. Um, they do what's called ascending, which means they become a part of the celestial clergy, which is basically this ascendant group thought um, that impacts reality. So, like the first person that like hit somebody with a rock probably ascended as war um because that was the first aggressive action that mankind ever taken so like usually usually like war is one of the first like ascended into the 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 celestial clergy every time reality remakes the idea being that when the celestial clergy hits 333 members the whole universe resets and we start all over again and we build the clergy back up um but until then you have these things called avatars and godwalkers which are servants of the celestial clergy who manifest these ideals um uh there's things like uh let's see what are ones that i can think of off the top of my head um like one of them was the demagogue which is somebody who delivers like news um like that's the, the not only do they not only are they a journalist but they embody journalism and integrity and stuff like that but the thing is is if you can take a different spin on it you can sometimes unseat people from the celestial clergy. So there was a concept in the book um, called uh, the Heisenberg messenger, which is somebody who doesn't just infl like deliver the news. They influence the news. Like they make the news have a certain spin through their own actions. Mm -hmm. And that has a negative connotation. And so what that person was trying to do in kind of the meta story of of one of the stories in the book is that they're trying to influence the celestial clergy more towards what they want the world, they perceive the world to be. Um, and so that's one big storyline that you can get involved in, in kind of a global campaign is influencing the celestial clergy and kind of um, world group thought. Um, Cause again, you did it, your decisions matter. Well, and I have to say that's pretty crazy because you know, like when you're talking about unknown armies, you know, like all of a sudden you're like, oh, by the way, the world's resetting after 333 of these celestial ascended are there. It's that seems like a big deal. Like, it, yeah, it is a big deal. And like, in the th the thing that's interesting about the celestial clergy is the way that it's kind of described is like the early concepts are all easy because like everything's malformed. Like, the mother is an easy concept at the beginning because like. Mm -hmm. the first woman that gives birth probably ascended as the mother because she was the mother she was the only example of the mother that there was and so she mm -hmm. ascended well later you can try and unseat this um you know by having a bad or different sort of thing but it gets a little bit harder to find those those last seats because everything's kind of filled up and does so it one tell of the you what all the seats are like i mean as a game master do you know all no, you have, 33 seats or no no you kind of look at the world and um you can kind of like it's funny because unknown armies is one of my favorite games because it really kind of influences how you start to see the world hmm. um like you see you see certain like trends come up and like as as somebody who game mastered you unknown armies a lot you see a trend come up and you're like who ascended to make that happen um, like what backwards thing happened to make that regressive thought or that proactive thought, like what made, what, what moved that into the, the zeitgeist that you kind of see in the world, because, you know, things come up and you're like, what, what made that a big deal now? And kind of the clergy is an interesting way to explain that in the, in the gaming world. It's like, oh, somebody ascended and unseated somebody who made it the old way. Oh. Um, and so like, you have a lot of like pretty much any concept you can think of. Um, like I ran one game where um, one common theme in a lot of 80, 80s movies that you saw for a while was this concept of the golden child, mm -hmm. like the kid who was infinitely pure and wise. Yeah. Um, and so I used that as a concept in one of my own armies games, the divine child. And the kid was trying to be the perfect like Oracle and everything, or well, his family was trying to keep him as the perfect Oracle um, and to eventually a, you know, ascend and, and change the cholesterol surgery for what they believed was the bed was, was better. And that was just kind of a concept I made up. They do have some sample avatars, um, in the book, um, the true King, uh, uh, the masterless man, the flying woman, um, are all like high level concepts. Like the true King can be the true King of pretty much anything. Um, like the King of the open road would be like a trucker. 
Like mm. he's the master of the open road um, and he can influence things like that. Um, but again, it's very human based and the powers aren't like the powers that you gain from this aren't, you know, world breaking usually, but, um, but it's all, it's all based around people. Like if, like there's this thing in the game called demons, um, they call them demons, but they're kind of revenant spirits and they're, they're people who, when they die, they have something that they were so obsessed with wanting to have finished that it kind of stripped everything away, but that passion. So when they possess someone, they usually just go on. Like there's one demon that I read about in a story who they just took the body, um, did what the, the magic magic person that put them in the body wanted them to do. And then they just went to like restaurant after restaurant and ate until they almost exploded because the person, the demon was obsessed with that sensation. And mm -hmm. when you're dead, you don't get any of that. Um, uh. So, so that's like wafer the, thin, like just just one more bite. Right, exactly. Like they're just obsessed with whatever whatever was like like I said, everything else is just stripped away and they're just that one desire. Um yeah. which is which is kind of an interesting concept. And then, you know, like it's all it's all like people on people stuff. And I think that's one of the most it's so different than um than other like kind of horror games and it's a modern game so it's kind of easier to like look and get inspiration um uh kind but of talking about go ahead out of curiosity i was just gonna ask like the so based on how it sounds like lore wise you know you're everything's presented and it's so flexible and immutable like you know coming from a more traditional dandy background where you know there's adventures and stuff like that that you can play is this does this kind of lead you away from that kind of like adventure like oh i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to unknown army studios i actually don't know where it's coming from um i go to uh, unknown uh, army's website and i go download the adventure you know mike is a heroin addict and he has a a party of you know purdue farmer executives or something I, I it could be say that, but i mean but it like, could be that could be that could be um that could be something that happens in the game it, de it definitely is of course because it's a modern game it's less heroic um yeah. and there is more of that um yeah there is more of that potential to have sort of games like that um um do you have more to that question? Because I'm not sure. No, no. I just, I was just curious if they had like standard like templates or if how did they, how did they, you know, use the, because it, because what it sounds like is that you know if I were to be if 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 I were to play it, I would say that this is a, a kind of a highly intellectual story game, and even even from a modern standpoint, it sounds pretty like it sounds pretty intense. And so I was just curious if they had like some starters to kind of wet your whistle and get into that, or they do. I mean, okay. Um, they have example adventures, um, which helps a bit. And character creation in the book, in the game, especially third edition, um, character creation is very much in the new style of game, where it's a uh, kind of a collaborative. Um, it's much more collaborative than trad traditional games. Um, it's very much a okay. You all kind of have this event that happens. Um, mm -hmm. What do you guys, you know? And then you set up a system of what you guys are. It's very more directed. It's, you know, what is your kind of goal of your group? What do you want to do as a group? Um, and you kind of all decide that um, together. So your characters kind of all have a similar background. But there are um, Atlas Games is the company that produces Unknown Armies. Um, and it does give you, you do have um, sample adventures, which kind of helps you um kind of look at the world and see how you can kind of bend it to your will um also it uh character creation character creation is a little bit more in depth um both in the traditional sense and in both in third edition and other editions um because there's no like there's no skill tree per se um it's kind of like well what do you want to do and then kind of make it up from there so it's very much one of those games of you know, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, so do that. Um, you know, uh, first and second edition was kind of famous for having this thing where like, it didn't have like the names of skills even. It was like, just make up, make the skills up to be whatever you want um, yeah. was kind of the thing, which was, which was really cool, but it was kind of difficult for, um, it was kind of difficult if people hadn't ever, 
like played a role playing game before, there was a lot of um kind of helping people understand like uh like there was a character who his whole thing was he was a boxer and um this is a character I designed. He was a boxer and his whole thing was um taking punishment, so he had the skill give a beaten and take a beaten. Um, and like, you could just make up what it does. So like, anytime he took damage, he would roll his take a beaten skill and he could reduce the damage, um, from a fist fight. Um, and that was kind of his, one of his main concepts, which gives you different abilities. Um, but it can be, it can be difficult making characters in unknown armies. Um, because it is, it's like, Hey, think of a real character. So usually what I do, they do offer some suggestions, um, when making a character, like they're very much, um, you know, think of a movie um and think of a character from a movie that you 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 enjoyed um and then try and like you know replicate that that person to a degree you can do that sort of thing um they suggest astrological signs is one of them mm -hmm. uh like and you know character concept aries this is kind of what they do um and that sort of thing so it can be difficult um it's a pretty in-depth game Sure. And from a character creation standpoint, I think I read somewhere that it uh, it, it covers two books because the DM has a certain way to run the character creation that's kind of in the DM book and or book two or whatever it is. And then the players have a way to kind of participate in character creation from, you know, kind of writing it all down, right? Yes. Third edition is very much a um, – it falls more in line with kind of uh, things like um, – I would say, uh, what is the name of that game? Powered by the Apocalypse kind of style, where um, it's not just like the GM is going to run a game. It's we're playing more of a collective, uh, a collective game, where it's like you're going to help angle this story. So yeah, there's actually like kind of the GM running the character creation to a degree, um, because it's like they suggest even to the point of having like a uh like a conspiracy board where like you have like uh pins and yarn going to like pictures to connect everybody together um That's fun. but i don't which, which sounds really interesting which sounds really fun um i would like to try a game someday like that but i i i, I, I still kind of like traditional games where it's like i have a story in mind and i would like to kind of have you guys involved in that story mm -hmm. um which the third edition unknown armies really isn't doesn't isn't really designed that way and i'm sure um i'm sure if stolzy heard me say that i want to run it the other way he wouldn't be happy but um <laughs> but uh but that's the thing is like i prefer the characters to make kind of characters and then we come up with a way for them to be together um, mm -hmm. One of my big influences that I still think would make a great Unknown Armies game, um, and we've discussed this before, is um, Sons of Anarchy when I watched it. Yeah. Um, there are things in, Unknown, in, in uh, Sons of Anarchy that are so strange um, that, like, like it just it just reads as an Unknown Armies game to me. Um, did you watch Did you watch uh, Sons of Anarchy at all? I I know of it, you know, because okay. I think on FX, like that was pretty much like the flagship show yeah yeah it was like it was like a huge deal um yeah, and it I and it watched it yeah and i suggest it because i suggest at least like a season or two i didn't get all the way through the, the season was um i didn't get all the way. that yeah he was and, I, and, okay. and his character like one of the things of like so, so this is because i run on on armies games is why it resonated so high to me i mentioned this to somebody else and they just looked at me like i was crazy but the reason that it, the, the reason that it stood out to me so much is like if you watch if you if you have run unknown armies and you look at at sons of anarchy like you see like archetypes from the game come up in the in the show like uh clay morrow who is uh ron perlman's character like watching him in the city of charming which is this like little made-up california town in the show like he runs it and it's like, oh, he's obviously an avatar of the true king. Like mm -hmm. and and charming is his is his domain. And so like without much power and influence he has, like it it to it, to an, to an unarmed army's person, it's like, oh, that makes just so much sense that it's like that because charming is such a weird little town that's like stuck in this like just stuck in like the forties kind of or the fifties. 
um you know when the sons of anarchy took the town over and like it's just such a thing and it's like no it would make absolute sense for this to be like an unknown armies game um and so it always it always i would uh, if i was gonna run hopefully someday um i can run uh the unknown armies game where everybody's a biker um and kind of the idea is yeah you're running this little town um and that's always been kind of my thing. And the way that the new system kind of works is the third edition system doesn't really stock. If you were just going to run it from the book, it doesn't really do that. But what it does do is it makes it a lot easier for new people, players and GMs to kind of, because everything is co- collaborative, it's a little bit easier to say we're running an unknown armies game. And then just everyone's sitting down and, you know making the story together um it's a little bit easier from that collaboration standpoint um i just don't want my players to have free will i guess yeah well i i well i mean but it's it's i don't know it kind of can get a little bit weird when you do that fully collaborative storytelling experience and i i guess i'm just so used to that more traditional like i'm the dm i have a story and you're all going to play in this story in some fashion is just is where my mindset is Mm -hmm. and that's just where i played most of my games because i i feel like i feel like the few times i've tried to do sandbox and kind of like have the players drive the story like there's a lot of setup there where if you're not careful i i feel like it can get off rails and just not turn into something that is fun but i'm sure on the other side there are people that put that together and they they stay where they need to and it just turns into an amazing experience right yeah because collaboration like the collaborative world building like i mean i i think i read somewhere that it's just like you know the the challenge being a dm is that if you want to write if you want to write an amazing story but the players are just kind of like extras then be a be a writer right don't <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. you know, you gotta... yeah that's not the purpose of that's not the purpose of role playing like yeah you'd just be a writer if yeah if that's what you wanted to just tell a story um yeah you wanted to be i i wanted to be interactive but there's still i want to have thought behind the interactivity like mm-hmm. and and not that there isn't thought behind uh second edition or third edition um unknown armies and how it works but i would just like to like you wouldn't have them all be bikers in the new game probably um well couldn't you run into that equation where the you know you they the players collaborate into a story that you as the the gm don't want to run yeah yeah you could um (laughs) like that could happen because that's the idea right like the the idea of the game now is that um don't have an idea what the game is going to be like don't Mm -hmm don't have that idea like you aren't going to have that opinion like you don't know what the game is supposed to be until you get to the table um which is which is very much a new which is very much a new um that's very much like how a lot of new games are like i said that's i mean that's the main tenant behind power by the apocalypse is you guys sit down and you guys decide what story you want to play and it's not going to be like I think in the I think in the Power by in the Apocalypse World book it says don't plan like don't plan anything before the first game. Like mm-hmm. I think it's in big letters where it's like don't you dare um sort of confrontationally like don't you dare plan anything because you know that's not your job or whatever. Um and it and it is very much that sort of um you know that sort of that sort of how this version of the game is played i would still say you can run it as a trad game traditional game where you have people generate characters and then you know stick them together and i and that's and that's exactly how i would do it um maybe i would use second edition like the sanity system is really nice um there's a sanity system in the game because it is a horror game um the sanity system is always nice in unknown armies um there's a lot to it um is it did they change it in third edition is is uh, it's a little bit more connected to it's a little bit more connected to actual skills. So yes, um, like I believe there is there is a point where like you can get worse or better at skills based on what your sanity is, hmm. um, which is a little bit interesting. Um, one of the other things is really interesting. I always find interesting about um, like uh, the skill system in Unknown Armies is when you look at the skills, it looks like they're all pretty low, and the reason is is because um, it, so. 
back taking a step back um the skill system in unknown armies is a percentile d100 system hmm. um so it's uh you know your score out of 100 uh like delta green and other games so um it's like uh if you have a 50 if you have a 50 in say fighty um my punch and skill um your goal is to roll uh 50 or under um doubles or criticals uh and then um your obsession allows you to flip flop certain some rules um but okay. it is d100 so system when ahead. you say flip flop you mean like basically that take the tens and ones and maneuver right them so yeah them. if you have a say you have a score of 50 uh-huh. um and you roll uh a 56 okay. that's a bad example uh say you have a score of 50 and you roll a 52. 51 yeah, yeah, 51 or 52, you can flop that to make that a 25. Gotcha. That, if it's something that you're obsessed in. Um, or I think you get one uh I think you get one non-obsession based one uh as well, once a game or something like that. But so that's what, so there is there is some mitigating things. But the idea, one of the ideas that I really like is that um your skills are basically like one of the things they say is your skills look strange because they're under duress. Like the idea is, is you don't have people roll things that are when they're not under stress, because Mm -hmm. like when you're walking, like, like at a shooting range, you wouldn't have somebody roll their necessarily roll their, um, their skill because you could determine pretty how good of a shot they are kind of based on the skill. And you wouldn't have them roll it because it's not pressure. Like they can line up, they can take as much time as they want to line up that shot. So yeah. there's no real reason to have them roll it. Um, but if they're in a gunfight, um, they're under duress. So that's when you'd have them roll because it's going to be hard. Like it's going to be difficult to get that clean shot off um, when bullets are flying everywhere. So that was one thing that I liked about the, the uh, I like about this, how they kind of describe the skill system. The other thing is um, uh, combat is super deadly. Like there is like, one of the things they say in unknown armies is they say, you know, combat should be your last option because one of you isn't walking home. Um, mm. <laughs> and so if you make the decision to fight somebody, like it's going to be dangerous just with fists, like somebody's probably going to be hurt. And then if you decide to get a weapon involved, like it's going to be bad for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, which that sort of realistic take on on violence is kind of refreshing, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Coming from the background of, you know, saddle up your horses and pull out your long swords sort of thing. Um, and there's a cool little blurb from, uh, I think, uh, one of the writers wrote where it's a kind of story driven, you know, it's like two of you in a room looking at each other and you know, one of you is not going to, one of, one of these mother's sons isn't going to see the sunrise tomorrow sort of description. Yeah. And like, and it's like, you know, and then it gives you ways. And then the core rule book, um, at least the second edition core rule book. And I think the third edition does too, gives you ways out of fight that don't involve fighting. <laughs> like, okay. Um, like, what do you, like, what do you mean? What's one of the, it's like, the... uh, talk your way out of it. Um, you know, try and make a deal uh you know um that sort of thing like just Let's try to deal do everything you can to not you know have this fight happen because mm-hmm. like it's not going to end well for either party um which i always felt was really interesting because especially in a modern game like unless you're playing an action game um like feng shui is a good example like mm-hmm. shoot 'em up should probably not be your first option because you're probably going to run into a situation where um there's cops involved you know um and that sort of thing so you know it's kind of like remember it might be bad if you just decide to go shoot them up in this so you know try not to try not to be violent all the time uh, I, and I think but i have to fine. say that i i've always liked that I've always liked it when a, there's a certain lethality for the characters in a game. And I, and the only reason I like it, and this is maybe because I've run more games than played in them is that, uh, is that, you know, it's, there's a, a certain point where just like, depending on your group, it's like the group just resorts to violence. If they know there's no, 
you know, it's like you have to work out all these consequences for violence that are far different if the, and then if they just like looked at it like a different puzzle and said, okay, well, violence being the last thing, what can we try before violence? <laughs> right. And like, and that's, and like in a lot of fantasy games, mm-hmm. we get back to D&D a little bit, um, like, like that, that is the option. Like, and part of that is because it's like, oh, well, they're just goblins. Um, we had a, when I was playing Shadowrun at one time, we had a fairly, fairly famous saying was, um, well, why wouldn't we shoot them all? They're just gangers. Like they're just gang members. Um, yeah. and like an unknown army is like, like, yeah, they're just gang members, but they're also people. Um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what makes the game game interesting is like I said, it's very people centric. It's like, yeah, but it's somebody who may have family that may not take kindly to you shooting their son or you know if you murder someone there mm-hmm. will probably be legal consequences to you doing this um you know and so that sort of thing just it just isn't common enough in games sometimes um like even even delta green like that does have sort of that um you know modern responsibility like at some point there you know there's the expectation that your FBI agent is probably going to get in some sort of gunfight. You know, mm-hmm. like if they kill the cultists, there's there is a government organization that may help them out of the situation. You know, yeah. versus unknown armies, it's like no, you're you might be a cultist, but you don't have any help. Like that's not gonna like no one's gonna come and get you out of this. Yeah. Um, and like and so there's a situation where it's like yeah, like you have to be kind of responsible for your own actions, and if you're not, um it could be bad and you need to, you need to recognize that. Um, and, and the weapons are all ultra lethal, like, um, like getting hit by a, a baseball bat could kill you just outright. Mm. Like, um, you know, if somebody crits by rolling a double and under their skill with a baseball bat, like you're probably dead. And like, it's very realistic in that if you go to the hospital, you're not out anytime soon, you're going to be hanging out in the hospital for a while. Um, you know, so it's pretty realistic in in those senses, um, which is kind of interesting too. Um, I think so curiosity yeah, is it is it more because like with Basin from earlier, like I said, it's just because you know it doesn't take many successes to get that. Is it is it kind of designed that way where it's like you know it, you can just have an unlucky death because even though you have a big dice pool or something, I don't even know. Yeah. It's not a dice pool game; it's a percentage game. So I guess yeah. No, uh, like a gun, like a gun in Unknown Armies. Um, if you get shot with a gun, the way that you roll damage is you basically take whatever you rolled. Um, if you hit, so say, and somebody with a gun is better at this. So say you have a 75 um, in mm-hmm. uh, in firearms, right? And say your person rolls a 70 um, okay. to hit with a handgun. Um, most guns just take the number. Um, like he did 70 points of damage <laughs> which is most people don't have a body of 70 which is where you get your hit points mm. like it's just that bad um and i think like like melee weapons take the the you add the two together so it would be it would be seven points of damage on a 70 but if it was like 75 it would be 13 which is usually like half of a person's hit points Okay. Um, yeah. And you don't tell, and you don't tell, you're not supposed to tell the players their hit points. Like you're not supposed to tell them you have, um, like you can get, or how many they have left. Cause they're probably going to know based on character creation, but you don't tell them how many they have left. So if you like got hit, if they got hit by like a baseball bat, like you'd say, Oh, Oh, that, that really hurt. Um, you wouldn't say you have 25 hit points left. You'd say, Oh, they, they, they hurt you very badly. You may. Okay want to make sure that doesn't happen again <laughs> sure well and I, I can't think of too many people that get hit with a baseball bat and go may i please have another <laughs> like, yeah exactly um and a baseball bat's one of the ones that stands out um and there's also usually a bonus i think to firearms so it's usually something like <laughs> the roll plus 10 or something like that so like yeah so if, like you roll a 60 like you might just out and out kill a person <laughs> so so mechanically that means that the the closer you are to your level your that's your target number that's the better success it is like a one right. is actually the the worst best success uh, the, the success is, that's the worst one is still is one a, i think one is still a critical success 
oh, okay. critical success along with doubles. So like if you have a score of 60 and you roll a 55, like that's a crit success. Um, but that would be they, better because it's closer to 60 rather than closer. Exactly. To one. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's the, it's similar to um, I mean, there's only so many dice systems that you get, so it's kind of similar to Delta Green, except usually you have less skill points in general. Like you don't see mm-hmm. those seventies as often as in like Delta Green. Usually you see like fifties, sixties, um, because the idea is again, like if you're rolling, it's because you're under stress. Like yeah, if you're doing that research, it's because you're on a deadline where you need to have the like information now. Um, okay. if you're, you know, firing a gun, it's because somebody's firing back. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the, the basis of unknown army is both character creation, like kind of the raw mechanics. Um, and then, uh, there's the sanity system. We didn't really talk about the sanity system. Basically, whenever you're confronted with some sort of horror, um, you, uh, you, do you, I don't even think you roll. You just, um, yes, you do. You roll a challenge and then you either become hardened or, um, or not to based on whether you fail or succeed. And if you mm-hmm. fail a certain number, um, you can develop a phobia or like some sort of disorder. If you harden enough, um, you can eventually become sociopathic, um, which means you don't, you no longer get the benefits of any of your obsessions, which your obsessions are basically what make your character kind of work. Um, right. It's what you, allows you to like mechanically flip flop roles and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so if you, if you, if you go crazy um, to the good, like even, if, even the positive results, um, you can run into problems where mechanically you're punished for it because, you know, being constantly exposed to, violence or supernatural stuff or stuff like that that's making you you know affecting your sanity like if you become a sociopath it's not necessarily a good thing um you know and and the game is very good about portraying that being like no like negative sanity isn't good either negative sanity has its repercussions okay Um, and then your character can do things like go to therapy and stuff like that just like in kind of in delta green to try and uh make it better yeah kind of like offload some of that psychic damage onto somebody else exactly um or you know at least uh (laughs) or at least try and get some help on that you know new new problem that you're starting to develop the kind of the idea in an armies is like no one in unknown armies is a normal person like um if you're some sort of uh wizard uh let me just i'm just gonna call it wizard for now just if you're some sort of person that has magic like you're probably obsessed to the point where you can't have like a day job Mm -hmm. um like one of the the more less um the less damaged ones is um there's a school of magic where they're obsessed with a particular tv show right um like say you're a a fanboy or something like that. yeah yeah say you're obsessed with star trek okay um and so the way you would power up your magic is by never missing an episode of Star Trek. Mm, um, okay. So if you are obsessed with Star Trek and you need to see it all the time and your job wants you to be there when it's on, mm. you're probably not going to go to work. <laughs> you're probably going to be like, no, I can't be here. Um, and they're going to be like, why? And you're going to be like, I need to see Star Trek. Uh, and then they're going to think you're crazy um or you know or like uh the um Carcinio Mancer, which is the smoker like okay like they have to smoke to get their magic like a lot all the time so like it would be hard now especially modern day 2022 like i have to go outside and smoke every five minutes <laughs> that you know that or that would not work for most people. Exactly. You could be a trucker, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. So, so like most of the schools of magic, while they sound cool, like again, the idea is is they're, they're you're they're damaged in some way. You're semi irreparably um, because they've gotten to the point where they actually see benefits that other people don't have to their obsessions. So, um, out of curiosity, I mean, is it, so based on how freeform it seems to be in. Uh, so many ways like is there is is like the schools of magic are they kind of set with what they have in the book or are you free to kind of say well you said there's fanboy thing is that like yeah you can you can make your own schools of magic um there's two types of ways to make your own schools of magic 
um there's a full-fledged school where you would sit down and kind of like figure out all of these ways that you so the way that the school of magics work is there's a ways that they all gain charges um okay which charges are basically the 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 battery for their mojo so like i said with a with a a carcinio or yeah a carcinio mancer will use him as a as a as an example so with a carcinio mancer they get a charge basically i think every time they smoke a cigarette um so in essence they could be very powerful um but the other idea is they get so you have three levels of then you have three levels of that you have a base charge a significant charge and a major charge so the base charge is something that they can do gather pretty easy usually like a carcinio mancer is like smoking a cigarette okay. a significant charge is like smoking like five packs of cigarettes in a 24 hour period or something crazy like that it's like okay you're smoking you're chain smoking without stopping and maybe not sleeping and then a major charge in carciniomancy is gained by getting cancer <laughs> um like every time you smoke a cigarette in as a carciniomancer you roll a luck check and if you fail it you have cancer you have lung cancer and now you have a you have a major charge but you're also probably dead <laughs> unless you can figure out a way to fix it um well, i hear you can take lungs out <laughs> so like so that's the thing is like so that's the three levels of power so like if you wanted to make up your own school of magic you would do that you kind of just need to sit down and be figure out like one you need to figure out the paradox okay like like yes i get power but what is what is the thing about it that isn't that's it's a little bad. bit yeah that's bad or a little bit out or or doesn't make sense like like the epiduromancer is an easy one i control the outside because i control my skin mm. um like and that's the easy one um i mean not easy for the character but kind of an easy concept to accept or understand um the thought process behind um chaos magic is the same way like i risk now so i can manipulate fate later um and those are pretty easy ones so like there's a lot in there's quite a few so i always suggest people kind of take a look because you can a lot of times find one that fits um mm -hmm. And that kind of becomes your character concept too. Like you don't just have somebody, you know, you don't have Bob, the epiduromancer, you have the epiduromancer Bob, because again, it's, it is who he is. It's his obsession. It's his life. Um, he probably has body modifications and tattoos and things like that. Like that is his life. That is the person he is. It is not, it's not a thing he does. It's a thing that he is um and so the school of magic is is kind of like like it's important to stress that because a lot of people think like it's a cool way to just get power mm -hmm. um in character but like like being an adept in unknown armies means basically your life is ruined for it <laughs> like it's hard being in a relationship when you need to watch star trek every time star trek comes on the tv <laughs> yeah <laughs> unless they're also into star trek as much as you are right which there's a lot of star trek and usually two adepts have of the same school don't get along very well because they um they have conflicting ideals of what the school is like because oh. like people who are not right in the head sometimes don't get along very well with it. like if you have two people who are obsessive compulsive not that i'm a doctor or a psychologist or anything but if you have two people who have the same similar compulsions they might not get along very well because their compulsions become contradictory. Oh, that makes sense. And I and yeah. I mean, it's not that I've ever, you know, I've never seen fans of a particular, you know, um, property ever get mad at each other for a different interpretation. <laughs> yeah, it's anyway. not like that's ever happened, right? That, that's never <laughs> ever happened. I mean, I Good couldn't point. possibly see that happening in Marvel or Star yeah. Wars or now, Star Trek. Now imagine that you're obsessed to the point where you won't go to work to watch these shows like yeah. so you know when you've decided this is your life like stabbing somebody over it might not be that big of a deal it's true <laughs> well the good news is is that the um and this and it's actually funny because like i think in in that particular sense i almost think that modern day has helped that person a little bit because <laughs> now you just it's midnight whatever eastern time now you just put the show on yeah you're a little tired going to work you got to get that copy but you don't have to miss it or you just have that spreadsheet 
application where you just like are watching it at work and then you hit the spreadsheet when your boss comes by and so you're like i'm, I'm obviously working boss obviously. well if i remember right well and well that's true and if i remember right like in the school like it has to be like there's rules to it like oh. if it's something like if it's a syndicated tv show like you have to see it and like you have to set the time specifically that you watch it mm. like so if you're like star trek is a syndicated show it's yeah. like okay i watched it two because it's on nickelodeon at two i watched it three because it's on this other channel at three and then i watched it at sci-fi on seven and like you can't miss any of those because if you if you it's called taboo if you break your taboo that means you don't have any more juice like all of your charges are gone um so like if you're if you're a carcinomancer one of the guys that smoke if you don't smoke you lose all your magic like you which is of course very bad (laughs) like sure um so like it's but this could get dark pretty quick too like i mean we're talking about like star wars and star trek but you could obviously replace that with something a little bit more x-rated and well yeah very um, awkward character (laughs) well there is uh there is something in the book uh it was a big part of second edition um called the naked goddess which was a woman who ascended as a the i think she was called the perfect fantasy woman is the archetype that she ascended as no one's really sure but she was a porn star and she ascended on a uh, a, a shoot um and okay. so this the naked goddess tape um was like a big artifact in in unknown army second edition and probably in third edition because it was a it was a it was a film of somebody ascending to the assist celestial clergy oh um well, that's neat yeah so that was that was yeah so yes there are things that could it it is a very adult game um we probably could should. be a very adult game it could be it could be well chances are it's gonna probably be um so i always suggest people you play it with people you trust people who enjoy and people who are who want to play that sort of game because it's probably going to get dark one way or another um, it'll be well, very I mean, good at deepening your bonds. It'll feel even, very much like you've you've experienced something that you don't necessarily need to share beyond the table. You know, even like uh, an epidermomancer, which is a very powerful character, like it's a very powerful like wizarding character, magic character in mm-hmm. armies. But like to have that character, you kind of have to deal with the idea of self mutilation and cutting, and kind of the psycho psychology behind somebody who does that to themselves. Yeah, that's um. Right. And that's dark. It's 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 a hard subject to to do. And if anybody's ever struggled with it, like it might be best to keep it off the table because um, uh, it is it is a hard it is a hard thing. Um, and and it's and it's and it's one of those things that's strange because like there's a character in I don't think they're in third edition anymore, but they're in second edition. There's a character called the Freak, um, who's a master of epidermancy, and like they're just a super cool boogeyman type character. But like the actual like background of the character is just so tragic, mm-hmm. um, because essentially that's how it started is them just being, you know, trying to impact the world because that was the only thing they could control was the damage yeah. done to their body, um, and it and it started to allow them to influence you know things around them. So, um, so it's always yeah. So there's I mean somebody who I mean somebody who plays Russian roulette. Uh, that's pretty dark too that seems like yeah. an easy one like the chaos may just seem like oh well that's not that dark like they just you know skateboard or take risks and it's like they're taking risks with the, the knowledge that they are going to or eventually hurt themselves like like you can't just do danger like it's what i always say about skateboarders like the skateboarders i used to knew know like they always said it isn't if you get hurt it's when you get hurt and how bad um, because you're going to get hurt if you're if you're if you're doing if you're skateboarding with any sort of purpose, like you're well, going to miss a jump and break your leg. Yeah, and I have seen people do that. <laughs> exactly, um, and it's uh, yeah, I, I can attest it's not pretty. Right, exactly. So it's the same sort of thing. It's like you're you're doing this with the understanding that it's inevitable that you're probably going to be injured um, or killed, depending um you know so um it's just very very it's a very compelling modern setting in my opinion end game system and like (laughs) like i would 
and I'm going to get political for just a second. I'm sorry. Oh, whoa, listening. whoa. Okay. Um, <laughs> trigger warning or something. <laughs> but I mean, He's like, talk about politics. Imagine what happened in the invisible clergy for Donald Trump to get elected. Like, something I, went horribly wrong. <laughs> Or horribly right. It really depends on um, horrible. I mean, well, like Some, something well, very different happened, right? Like the idea of well, and like the concept of fake news. Like something impacted the gamut demagogue to make people not trust them anymore. Like something mm-hmm. happened, um, and that that's kind of what the thing is. Is like that's that's what an army armies kind of does to your brain. Is like you start looking at your things and like what could have happened to make this group thought a thing like what could have happened to make everybody who trusted journalists for the last you know 300 years since the birth of journalism what could have happened to make them not trusted anymore um and and you know and there's very real grounded reasons for that but from a storytelling standpoint it's like you know something had to have happened and the celestial clergy to make this happen either somebody ascended or or got bumped from the celestial clergy for a different concept that makes them not as trustworthy and people mm. can feel that and it impacts the tides of everything that we see um and it's kind of a neat, it's kind of a neat storytelling thing and it allows you to kind of build stories and look at stories um for unknown armies in an interesting way and once you start playing unknown armies like everything kind of becomes inspiration that you see that's weird in the world um mm. Like, so it's easy to get story ideas, at least for me, for Unknown Armies, because, like, I can look at things and I can be like, oh, well, that would make a good, good Unknown army story. And you can tell almost any story that's people based, like something like a bank robbery, like Reservoir Dogs. You hmm. could run a Reservoir Dogs style game. Pretty easy in Unknown Armies, even without the occult influence. That's good. I mean, Although so you could make the twist and make it more occult influence, too. Uh, like, maybe they're not stealing diamonds. That's fine. I I do have to say, like it is, it like in terms of like what the concept and the premise is. The the premise sounds very interesting to me because I think, you know, I think it the character stories are always very interesting from my perspective. You know, it's it's not necessarily like like what creature did you overcome or what dungeon did you delve, but it's just like how did these people evolve over time in this story, like. You know, and I and I think that in this game, because it's so self-destructive, it sounds that you could have some really crazy crashes and burns. Like, mm-hmm. and <laughs> and honestly, because of how self-destructive and dark it can be, I feel like you tell a lot of very human stories. Mm. Um, because we all know people that have struggled with different things like that, and it's very fanciful. But um, I yeah. think you can tell, in my experience, you can tell very good stories with unknown armies, like you Mm -hmm. can have a lot of character impact, even if it's more of like, even if you're playing it pretty light and like um, people are like, there's one unknown armies uh, podcast that I strongly suggest. I really love people listening to. Uh, I really suggest people listen to from RPPR. Um, It's called the great American bakery Ascension, I think. Mm. Um, And this, it's this group of guys get pulled into um, by somebody that they owe a favor And basically the plot is that um, there was an American great, there was an American great British bake off and the person ascended in the middle of it as the, as the baker. Um, And like, so they're trying to find like, like the, the, the lady that's sending them out on the mission is like, so there's probably some of the cake left and I, I need you to find it. And like, that's the point plot for the story is like, go and find, go and find these things that happened in this ascension, like the cookies that she baked, the cake that she baked. If you can get the Mm. tape that she ascended on, like that would be great. Um, And it's, and it's more of a fun, it's more of like just a kind of fun unknown army scenario. Um, You know, it's not as dark. There is another one um, called the power of love, which I also suggest, which is a little bit darker because it's about a guy who has fallen into a bad, like an abusive relationship. Um, and his friends basically want to rescue him from this abusive relationship. Um, and a couple of them are adepts, i.e. people that know magic. <laughs> and so it's pretty sketchy from there. Like they kidnap the guy and sure. stuff like that. And like, and it's just, you know, and it, it's fun, but like, it's definitely has a little bit more of a darker undertone because it involves like, you know, relationship abuse and, you know, abuse and relationships and stuff like that so and and as a disclaimer we obviously don't condone any 
any psychological torture, real life violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like we, et cetera. Yeah. We, Trigger we, warning. We, we are not. We we like telling stories. We don't, but we don't like harming people. Yeah, and sometimes stories. I mean, and that's the thing, though, right? Is sometimes yeah. stories involve stuff that's hard for people to deal with. Yeah. Um, and I think so. we could probably. I think that I might think be. Good. A, I think I that think might be an, a a an episode a later where we talk to. Well, we could stop there too. I mean, I, I oh. you know, I, I I'm happy. To, it sounds like you're really passionate about the game, and I think when people have you know a lot of passion with it, you know, I'm surprised we haven't played it more. Honestly, Brent, I think I think it, it it's a certain type of game, so I think everybody's kind of got to be in that headspace to play it. And sometimes, you know, living the living the life of a corporate drone, it might be exhausting to come and then have that be your your pressure your pressure relief valve you know i had a stressful uh, day at work let's let's get into this really dark psychological yeah, yeah like, <laughs> psychological horror game yeah sometimes it's, it's just nice to hunt monsters um yeah you just like well i we could do that or <laughs> you could you know get your uh get your get your sword swinging on and yeah and i think and i think that's one reason one of the things that i think like call of cthulhu is is a little bit more of a of a more accepted game is because it projects some of that stuff outwards. Like I said, mm-hmm. having a game that's like, nah, if it's bad, a person did it, um, is kind of one of those bracing things where it's like, nah, if it's if it's shitty, if it sucks, yeah, you don't. In this yeah. world, a person did it, which is very much like the real world, which is very much. No, that's really probably how it works. Is if it's a, <laughs> it's a crappy thing that happened, yeah, somebody's probably responsible for that. That's funny. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a it's a tough twist. Yeah, it's it's a tough twist. So I guess I guess you've already run this game. But I, so I guess the question is, is would I run the game? Indeed. Um, I you know I have to say I would I would run it. Um, but I would be intimidated by it at the same time because I, you know, like heroic fantasy tends to be where I'm more comfortable, and this definitely feels like it would be out of my wheelhouse. So I feel like my first session I would probably. I would probably get into a dark place just getting prepared and playing with the players and all that stuff. But I feel like based on how it's described and how it's done, I, I really feel like it could grow on me. I'd have to I'd have to really practice to be that kind of DM, it though. definitely changes what your perspective of a hero is. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes a hero is the guy that walks away. Yeah. Um, and that's... And Unknown Armies is very real in that sense, is that sometimes not doing that thing that you really want to do Sometimes that is heroic, um, which I think is cathartic to a degree because, um, I mean, there's a lot of things we can get into, but sometimes walking away from a situation that's bad um, is the best option. Um, and yeah. I think sometimes this game can help. Deal. I mean, I've used the game. I've used the game to deal with some real life issues once in a while. So um, yeah. it's a nice vehicle for that sort of storytelling. Um, yeah, so I guess so I guess that means that we'd you know it may it may go on that list of games I'd like to run and I don't have a plan for it immediately, but I I could see revisiting this a little bit later and who knows would, maybe would would run. Um, and you I definitely can run. and you definitely yeah and you definitely can play games a lot lighter than the base material sends. Oh, that's like, true. Um, one of the the <clears throat> excuse me one of the uh introductory adventures in second edition is uh called Bill in Three Persons. Okay. which is about a person who splits into three different people um, and kind of how the players kind of help him out. Um, and it deals, all, it's not as dark. It's pretty light um, and mm-hmm. it's a good introduction. Um, uh, it's one of the things that it's a, it's a, it's a written game adventure that I would like to play someday with a group of people. Um, and there aren't that many of those adventures that, I usually want to play like written adventures usually isn't my, my forte. Sure. Well, yeah, I get that. And that's, and that's okay. I mean, play, I just play how you want to play. Right. I think we already talked about. (laughs) Well, yeah. And we can talk about written adventures, you know, more in some other episode, but um, yeah. So I guess, so with that, um, I think that's our two games. Uh, You know, this is, this has been quite the, quite the, the talk, you know, we've gone through kind of, light-hearted horror to some pretty deep dark psychological stuff but at i think it at the end of the day it's two games that if you haven't heard of them hopefully you at least are interested enough to to check them out for yourself um i feel like you know if it's if it's i don't know if we're going to actually talk about 
bad games unless we have a, a game on here because i feel like even like there's very few games out there that are just so bad that they're just a mockery of the system itself um i mean i could probably name two right now if you and if you're thinking of those two you're probably right brent but um one may start with f and end with addle <laughs> Yeah, Fatal is the one that uh, is the game. I think that is the pariah game. Um, and, and there are definitely some games out there that may be questionable in, in content, you know, and I think I sh I shared that with you earlier. And I don't, I mean, we're I know we're a mature audience, this kind of thing, but I don't think I'm going to be talking about FAP, the role-playing game, anytime soon. <laughs> oh, no. No, I don't think so either. I think, um, I think one of our goals should be to mostly review games that we think we're going to like, at least in first. Um, because First I think blush. there are some other podcasts out there that don't ever review games that they think they're going to like. Um, mm. Not that I'm calling anybody out. Don't hate me. Um, they don't ever review games that they like, and they're never going to review them positively. Yeah. Um, and I would rather be a little bit more positive with some of the stuff that we do. So Sure. Well, that's fine with me. So, um, so at this point, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, everybody that's made it this far again, thank you. Uh, you know, hopefully if you have that long hour long commute both ways, you know, you get to hear us talking all the way through and you get to hear our complete thoughts. Um, hopefully. Uh, but you know, we do appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for, so much for being here. And, um, and next week, I think because we're still in spooky time and we're just about to hit Halloween, we're going to try to hit up some r slash RPG horror stories and maybe share some of the stuff from around the neighborhood. Um, I think that'd be kind of fun. I, I think, you know, you know, it's kind of, and probably, you know, it, it, I think that r slash horror story, uh, RPG horror stories is kind of interesting because it's not necessarily the game that's horrific. It's the, situation that's horrific so i mean maybe we'll find some scary games maybe we'll find some some scary situations who knows what we'll see it's a bag of bag of tricks or probably both maybe if we're lucky both probably <laughs> probably just <laughs> really bad situations that shouldn't be shared outside of reddit but um, um i don't know i'm trying and, and it'll give me a chance to think of some really bad situations that i've been in uh in role-playing games and see how uh if i can remember any of those i'm sure i have them um, yeah. I may have blocked them out, though. Well, it, well, you don't have to necessarily dig up your own personal dirty laundry for this. We can we can share everybody else's dirty laundry, and that's fine. Oh, too. okay. That's a good you plan. Know, you know, I mean, why why necessarily expose our vulnerabilities when we can laugh at people on the <laughs> internet or something? Who knows? <laughs> so, um, uh, that, and good. with that, we're going to go ahead and, and sign off. I uh, hope everybody rolls well and rolls wise. And uh, hit us with that scene, Brent. And scene. <laughs>